taking a look at real love, what Jesus says about love, because the world has a different view of love than what Jesus says. So we left off last week with talking about how God loves everyone. We talked about John 3.16. This week we're going to talk about another one of Jesus' teachings. So Jesus is approached by, some would say, a lawyer, someone that knows the law very well. And he asked Jesus, how do you enter the kingdom of heaven? And he says, love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then I don't know if you've ever had someone kind of try to trick you with a question before. Has anyone ever been there? Like, you know they're they're prying and they just want to catch you off guard. He does that to Jesus. And he says, well, who's your neighbor? And there we start the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus says, there is a gentleman. He was walking down the road. And he gets beat up and basically gets everything stolen from him. And then he says this. As he was lying there, injured, there is a priest that walks by, does nothing. Later, there is a Levite that walks by, does nothing. That's important to remember because those are religious leaders. They're supposed to represent God. And then a Samaritan comes by. And something to know about Samaritans, they didn't like Samaritans. Samaritans were not people that Jewish people really wanted to socialize with or be around. So the Samaritan walks by, and when you think about Samaritan, he knows that this person probably doesn't like him. But he gets down, tends to his wounds, and does more than that. A lot of times we think, well, he just helped him get back on his way. No, he gets him, lets him ride his donkey, takes him to an inn, pays for his stay, and tells the innkeeper, hey, whatever he needs, just bill me and I'll come back tomorrow. And then he says, and Jesus ends with that. And then now we're left with the question, who's our neighbor? Well, in that situation, we're seeing a neighbor is anyone that has a need. See, he needed someone to help him. And the Samaritan who knew this person probably is not a fan of him because just of who he was. And he steps in and helps him. See, we can show kindness. And when we show kindness, we are showing God's love to people. And those are, it doesn't just mean whoever we want to show kindness to. That's really easy, right? It's really easy to show kindness to people that we want to show kindness to. But we're supposed to show God's love through kindness to everyone we come across, anyone who is in need. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. It is good to be with you. Sharma and I were away for two Sundays, and uh, what, a, what a joy to be back. And so as our children head off to Faith Kids, we're glad for them, glad to see them, glad to see families with us today. It's good to see some faces we haven't seen in quite a while. So welcome to the worship service. We're glad you could be here today and that you ventured out. As I mentioned, Sharma and I were away. We were in Florida, and I want to clear up two misconceptions, okay? One, Florida is not always warm, okay? There were three or four days it didn't get out of the 50s, and yes, (laughs) yes. You should feel my pain. There were three nights that it frosted. Yes. Been good to know you, Pastor Mike. So I wanted to clear that up. Second, for those of you who have said, I I sure hope you enjoyed your vacation, I spoke every day at Avon Park Camp, so it was not a vacation. Um, but we were away. We were in Florida. Those, those two things are true. But Florida <laughs> did not quite deliver. I just, I just, I've got a little bone to pick with Florida. And, you know, we were south of frostproof. 
Yeah. So there's just a lot about all of that that just wasn't right. But I want you to know we were, we were glad to get home. We came home early, earlier than we had anticipated, and we got in just about two hours on last Monday before, two hours before it started to snow and woke up to nine inches of snow. So what a swing. But I want you to know this, about Thursday of, of that week, uh, Sharma looked at me, and we must have been thinking the same thing. She said, are you ready to be home? I said, yes, I'm ready to be home. And we're delighted to be back, even though there's snow, even though it's cold, even though it's winter up here, we're glad to be back. And we're glad to be back with you so that we can worship together. I thank Dr. Case and Pastor Aaron Green for ministering in our absence. Thank you for helping and thank you for serving. We're, we're grateful to you. Thank you for being here, and thank you while we were away for praying for us. We appreciate all of that. During this month, this is a very, very important month for PDHC, and I just want to emphasize that singular announcement today. We are participating during this month, it will conclude at the end of this month, by helping PDHC raise necessary essential funds. They are a wonderful ministry. And they do a tremendous job in loving moms that they hope will carry their baby to term. And they are uh, a gracious presence at a time in many moms' lives where they're uncertain, where they are facing all kinds of stresses. But PDHC uh, is there to stand with them and to help them, but also to encourage them to and urge them to choose life for that little child. And I think it's significant that one of the points of ministry is giving the opportunity for a mom to see signs of that little life, so ultrasounds and, and all those things that can be done to help them understand there's a precious little life in their womb is what PDHC is about, among other things. So we are glad for uh, a partnership with them. We're thankful that we can join them and work with them in this great work. So during the month of February, we are filling baby bottles. Now, if you didn't pick up a baby bottle, that's okay. You can give a check. Uh, you can give cash. You can put it in an envelope uh, during giving times or, or during, um, and, and visit the kiosks, I should say. And you can indicate that you want those gifts to go toward PDHC. So even if you didn't get a baby bottle and you didn't pick that up, that doesn't mean you can't participate. You certainly can, and we encourage you to do so. So this month in particular, along with everything else that takes place in the life of this church, we are encouraging you to participate in supporting PDHC. So I trust that you will do so. This last week... Uh, we had a funeral service on Thursday for Bob Dannison, and our, and our birthday and wedding anniversary reminders for February, this was printed before Bob passed away. Today was Bob's birthday. So uh, what a dear soul, what a wonderful, wonderful spirit, dear, kind man, and uh, he would have been 72, I believe, today. But birthdays that are being celebrated, Andrew Carter... Uh, today, Toby Johnson today, uh, Cindy South tomorrow, Connie Rudin on the 18th, Sydney Ellis on the 20th, uh, Rich Klinger on the 20th, Trinity on the 20th, I, I've, I would butcher the last name, is it Nizek? You might say, I don't recognize that name, that's because I probably butchered it, so just thankful for Trinity. Uh, Aaron uh, Lacey on the 20th, Helen Mann on the 20th, and then we will announce those 20 uh, on the, that have birthdays on the 21st and beyond next Sunday. It's good to be in worship, isn't it? And we also welcome those who are with us by live stream. And as vaccines are made available, I was receiving calls this week, encouraging calls this week, that folks were saying, Pastor, we'll be back this Sunday. We plan to be back this Sunday. Several were saying, we're getting our second dose. We'll be back this Sunday. So it was wonderful to hear that. And I look out and see your faces masked, but I see your faces and glad to see you, glad to be back in worship together. So it's a joy that we have that we must never take for granted to worship the Lord together. 
And we appreciate technology. We never, ever disregard its advantages, but we say wholeheartedly, in person is far better. In person is far better. So it's good to be in the house of the Lord together. I'd like for you to stand with me, and we're going to pray. And then following our prayer, uh, please remain standing for a responsive reading and for worship and song. Gracious Father, with joy in our hearts, we are gathered on this day. Our world marks this day. Our culture marks this day as Valentine's Day. But for every, for every child of God and for everyone who understands redemption because of Jesus and faith in Him, this is a day of recognizing, especially every Lord's Day in particular, we come in the love of Jesus expressing our love to you as a response to your initiative love in our lives, the fact that you pursued us before we ever knew you, before we ever thought of you, you came after us, you loved us, you were gracious to us, and in every way you have manifested true and perfect love in our lives. Thank you that your love aims to change us, and because of that marvelous transformation, we can love you and we can love our neighbor as ourself. So we thank you for the love of Christ today. We thank you for your love expressed to us, and we are fortunate, we are, are, are gifted and blessed and privileged today that we can love you in return. So may this time of worship be animated by the the wonderful, enlivening love of Jesus shed abroad in our hearts. May this be a wonderful time of worship. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join with me as we read responsibly or in unison from Psalms 51 through 6? The mighty one, God, the Lord, has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. May our God come and not keep silence. Fire devours before him, and it is very temptuous around him. He summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. Let's sing together about this God, the greatness of our God.
salvation he provides for us. Sing it now. Everyone needs compassion. the beginning of that song where it says everyone needs forgiveness a love that's never failing have you found it in the one Jesus Christ amen Savior you can move the mountain the mountain of sin and despair and destruction in our life praise the Lord praise the Lord let's bow for prayer as we continue to think on our great God Lord we love you today this is a season of love. We think a lot about it. 
we cannot be help but be drawn to your great love in our lives. It's the love that teaches us how to love. It's the love, dear Father, that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And somehow, dear Father, we can move above and beyond our selfishness to love others as you would love them. And Lord, we are so grateful and so thankful that you loved us. And we know that because your word tells us that God is love. And in this we know love because he first loved us. So we are thankful and we are grateful. And Lord, we confess our neediness before you today. As part of our worship, dear Father, we want to reach out and say, God, we need you in every aspect of our life. Be close, be real, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sing this with us.
spirit of prayer. Amen. Amen. Well, he invites us to pray. He hears us when we pray. And then he answers. How faithful is our God. Just want to remind us that this week, in the Christian calendar, this week is Ash Wednesday. And we move into keeping step and following after the steps of Jesus, as He moves toward His passion, as as He moves toward the cross. So this is an important time for us, and I trust that you will take advantage of it for your own spiritual well-being. We're looking today at one of the gospel accounts known as the Transfiguration. What a great event Uh, really a monumental event 
in the ministry of Jesus. And it is a time, it is a moment in time that uh, we, we, we see what we ordinarily would not see. But as we do, the adage kind of comes to mind, you just had to be there. There are some realities that language is too limited to describe, and not only do words not suffice, but it is so otherworldly that it's just beyond us to comprehend fully. The transfiguration, though it is briefly described, um, especially out of the three Gospels that mention it, it's briefly described in Mark's Gospel. That's where we're going to turn today, to Mark chapter 9. Mark is usually the briefest of all the writers, just cuts to the chase, leaves other details out, and is succinct in what he states. But don't let that in any way diminish the magnitude of this event. This is a magnificent event. And as difficult as it would ever be to put into words that can in any way accurately describe it, even though we're limited in what we can say to try to elevate it in our hearts and minds, even though we are restricted in that way, this is a monumental moment in Jesus' ministry and in the select apostles who were there in their comprehension of who Jesus is. So as much as we can, as much as we can be transported there, as much as we can be brought into this, um, I pray that we will intentionally, with great intention in our own hearts, let this setting seep into us and do its work in us. Will you do that with me today? Will you try that today? Let's let this word speak to us today. Mark chapter 9, first nine verses, and if you would, let's stand as we read, please. The first verse actually is a continuation of the previous chapter. And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with Him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and He was transfigured before them. His garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. All at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. And as they were coming down from the mountain, He gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. You may be seated. Simple title, They Saw Jesus. They Saw Jesus. Spiritually speaking, there is no greater vision than one can finally have. There is no greater experience than one can ever encounter than in a life-changing moment, in the parting of what is difficult to perceive and that which becomes crystal clear. There is no greater moment in a per person's life than to see Jesus. 
And you might say, well, I, when have you ever seen Jesus? Well, I'll say, I'll say this to us. It's highly improbable that Jesus looked anything like the pictures of Jesus that the churches have had for years. Okay? There are a lot of reasons for that, and I won't go into that. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to knock the artist. That's not my intent. But the best description of Jesus is given to us prophetically by Isaiah. He has no form or comeliness that we should desire Him. So Isaiah says, there isn't anything striking, there isn't any, anything significant, there isn't what we often see Hollywood like, there is no royal regal appearance to Him other than being very, very common. So think of this, the Son of God not only condescends to come to this earth and at the timing of the Father becomes the one who is the promised Messiah and ultimate Savior for us, and He just looks so common that we would forget His appearance after we saw Him. He was that common. So let's remember that. He wasn't some outstanding figure. His appearance was not such that you would have walked away thinking, wow, what a, what a leader-like figure. No, He was as common in His appearance as He could be. The difference about Jesus, obviously, was there was an unmistakable anointing to Him and upon Him. And there was a ring that whenever He spoke, anyone who was at all listening with not just their ears but with their hearts understood He spoke unlike anyone else they had ever heard speak. He spoke with an authoritative presence. He spoke with uh, just a confirmation attached and accompanying when he spoke. When he spoke, there was that hard to touch, hard to put your finger on it, hard to describe, but nevertheless real, very real presence that this one is different. He is different. But in this instance, when we, when we talk about the transfiguration, it was clearly a case where you just had to be there. How do you describe it? How do you describe something that is beyond what humans can do? How do you put that into any kind of a, of a system and any kind of a string of sentences and how do you put that into paragraphs and even if you went on and on and on in your attempts to describe, language would remain limited and you would not be able to depict something that was out of this world, that was otherworldly, not humanly possible. Language is like that. Human experience is like that. It's just limited. We're limited. But the reality that we find here in this passage, and some of the things that we find in this passage is what I want us to focus on today. What did they see, and why did they see it? What did they see, and why did they see it? Before we get there, I want us to just describe it as limited as it will be. I want us to describe a little bit of what they saw. If we also consider the other accounts Jesus was as this word that is used sparingly in the New Testament indicates, Jesus was transfigured. The event was a, a moment unlike any other moment. He was transfigured. And all of a sudden, not as if He were reflecting it, but in real time and in a real way because it was coming from him, there was a radiance and there was such a white, bright light, so significant, so gleaming, so glistening, that everything about Jesus from his countenance to his clothes had such a brightness, such a white brightness gleaming in, in, in its array, rays coming from him, there was such bright light coming from him that they said, well, it's kind of like this, 
But this couldn't be accomplished if you used the best soap in the world. You couldn't get anything this bright, this white. You couldn't do it. And it was coming from him. He was not reflecting it from another source. He is the light. So for a brief moment, we don't know how long this interlude was, but for a brief moment, the the human shroud is pulled back. The veil is pulled away. And in, in just a fleeting moment, we see who Jesus is. And His light is so radiant and undiminished and without restriction that it is a kind of light never seen on this earth before. Can't be described. Cannot be described. Indescribable brightness, radiating light beaming from Jesus. An overwhelming kind of light. Now, what did this do to human people? What did this do to human beings? What did it do? They were frightened. They were frightened. It was so significant they'd never seen anything like this. It was more than they could take in. It was pure light, no darkness at all. Everything about Jesus was radiant, radiant. Some questions, though, that we might ask would be, why did Jesus only take three apostles with him? Why only three? Why did Elijah and Moses show up? They were long gone before this. Then others might ask the question, especially in today's world and in today's evangelicalism, why didn't Jesus use this moment for marketing impact and self-promotion? I do want us to remember that Jesus has spoken to us, not just with His words, not just with that which came out of His mouth in ministry, but Jesus has spoken to us by what He does and what He doesn't do. His entire life, everything about His earthly ministry is a word, is a word to us. He speaks to us. So everything that He does speaks to us. Everything He doesn't do speaks to us. He speaks, He speaks, and He speaks again. So the fact that there were only three apostles with Him means something. The fact that Moses and Elijah showed up means something. And the fact that He never in any stretch of anyone's imagination would take this moment to be self-promotional says something. Says something. Think about what Jesus could have done if he, would have, if he would have said in his power, gathering all folks around him, what, what if he would have had a moment where all of a sudden he would have shown himself to the masses as to who he really was? We might say, well, my goodness, there would have been good that would have come of that. Many would have followed him, probably that wouldn't have followed him before. Really? Really? Why were just those three with him? Well, they're clearly the inner sanctum. They're clearly the ones that they will not only be present in that moment, but they'll be in Gethsemane. They'll be in those other isolated moments with Jesus. There's a closeness. There's an intimacy there that is without question. But why is Jesus doing this? What is becoming of this? And what are the lessons we can learn from this moment? Is it just for show? Or is there great meaning here? I believe there's great meaning. I don't believe Jesus was in any way prone to the carnival atmosphere. I believe Jesus was always speaking profound truth. So as the text relates to us in the beginning of it and at the close of it, in the beginning of it, we are reminded in very simple terms of of perhaps the most profound sight they would have ever seen have seen, and He was transfigured before them. (laughs) And then in verse 8, after the 
the surrounding and engulfing cloud that signifies the presence of God was gone, and Moses and Elijah were gone. They looked, and to their astonishment, they only saw Jesus alone. So in the grandest of ways, in the most magnificent of ways, this event is launched by them seeing Jesus transfigured. At the conclusion of it, it is as it, as it were the, a moment where the dust has settled, so to speak. It is a calmer moment. It is probably a more mundane moment. What all they see in Jesus at that time is, is likely very different than what they had seen previously. The whole setting is altered. The remarkable nature of Moses and Elijah being present is gone. The cloud is gone. There's, there's nothing else except the lingering, I think, word in their ear and in their hearts, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And then they see Jesus alone. Jesus alone. I want to share with you just a, f a few thoughts that I believe are a part of this great scene. What they saw when they saw Jesus was they saw reality. We often think the world as we see it and the world that engulfs us and the world that often threatens us, that that is the primary reality. But for a, for a moment, for a moment, a fleeting moment, they truly saw reality. They saw reality. And I want us to be reminded today, similarly to, where, to what we shared even last Wednesday night, you and I, if we have trusted in Jesus Christ, and if we have been washed in His blood, and if we have been made new, and if we are born again, and if we are walking in the light, and if His blood has cleansed us from all unrighteousness, and that is a current possession and current reality, I want us to know this, that has with it a greater reality than just where, where, uh, where the rubber meets the road. What we can see with our own eyes, what we can hear with our ears, what we often get just taken by and consumed by in our time and in our energy, this is a part of the real world, but it's not ultimately reality. God is the ultimate reality. And often we just get embedded and almost mired and at least up to our knees in the notion that this is it and it's not. He is it. And if there's ever a need in our own hearts and minds these days, we need to see Jesus. We need to see Him as the chief reality, who He is. He is the Son of God. Get that. He is divine. He is splendor's author. He is God in flesh. And He is the one who, when He has made promises, He will keep them. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is our King. He will come again. He will rule. He will reign. He is at the Father's right hand interceding for you and for me. This is a reality that you and I need to latch on to. He is God. And in that moment, in that moment, Peter, James, and John saw God in the way that humans can see Him. It was indescribably radiant and bright. And they saw who Jesus is. Boy, we need that. We need to see who Jesus is. Such a radiance. And this word that is used, that is translated transfigured, means this. It doesn't mean that Jesus put on a different appearance. No, this has to do with essence. So why have I said what I have said? Because for a moment, His human flesh, His humanity could not hold back His essence. It burst through couldn't be contained, and the radiance was indescribable. Isn't that good? 
It was who he is that came out that day. It shone forth. The reality of who he is. The, also the reality of spiritual matters. Everything in this setting has a spiritual truth and a spiritual tone to it. You and I do not live solely or exclusively in a physical world. You and I live in a spiritual world. Often that gets put aside or is often just occasionally mentioned or discussed. But the reality is we are far more working in operating in a spiritual world than we are in a physical world. Think about that for a while. Life is far more spiritual than it is physical. Don't get, don't get just held by and contained by the physical world. You and I are spirits temporarily here temporarily embodied, and we have something ahead of us that is eternal, and this is not it. So the real world is spiritual. So reality. We, they saw reality. They saw radiance. They also saw both in, and heard what Jesus said, but they also saw something significant. They saw Elijah and they saw Moses. Now, yes, represented in those two visits, you have the law and the prophets. Yes, that's true. And fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Yes, that's true. But let's, let's not skip a detail that's important. They had both gone through interesting exits from this world. We, do, do we remember that? Elijah was translated. You've read your Bibles, haven't you? Elijah was translated. He was moved higher. So the implication is he didn't die a physical death like the average person will. So all of a sudden we have the guy who was translated there... But we also have Moses who did die there. <clears throat> Solves a lot of questions about Moses. You know, there have been those who have thought, well, if he didn't get into Canaan, does that mean he didn't get into heaven? Moses is on the Mount of Transfiguration, and I don't think Jesus would be chatting with a guy that was not in good stead. Okay? What are we witnessing? What are they seeing right in front of them? They are seeing what God does with someone who doesn't die and the form that they take and what God does someone with someone who does die. They are looking at resurrection power right before their very eyes. Now think about that. Yes, they see Jesus. Yes, they see who He is. But they see, and they see radiance. But yes, they see resurrection power in the presence of the living Christ. Amen. You know, if somebody was walking around who was raised from the dead, that would get, that, I think that would get someone's attention. And it did that day. They also, not only do we see resurrection power, we see marvelous realization of truth. Everything about Moses and Elijah, they represent everything that came with them in their offices, whether or not it was their prophetic role or it was the role of bringing to the people God's law. All of that combined in every regard and in every very, very detailed way, Jesus is the one with whom they have a conversation, and Luke gives us a little bit of, uh, of a picture about that conversation, but the fact that they are conferring with Jesus is, as it were, a recognition. It is, it, it is a relinquishing of what might have been authoritative before, but is fulfilled now. 
They are handing off, in a sense, any authority that God would have used through them or poured through them and used to speak about that one who was to come. And they are saying in that moment, in their own presence, conferring with Jesus, they are saying, and God is saying, and Jesus is confirming, this now is all fulfilled in Jesus. Everything that has led up to this pointed to this. Everything that was before is now fulfilled in the now. And Jesus is the realization of it all. He is the concluding word, the fulfilling word, realization. There is, in essence, a worshiping. There is a bowing to. The law and the prophets are bowing to the one and only, to Jesus. Last, there's redemption. There's redemption. While Peter was making his own recommendations, and we'll not get into those recommendations, you know, as other texts say, having nothing to say, he spoke. I'm always, I'm just, I always find that funny. God does have a sense of humor. Peter, having nothing to say, spoke. Don't don't be in that camp. (laughs) Don't be in that group. Having nothing to say, don't just pipe up. It's unwise. Having nothing to say, he spoke. Being terrified, he decided to make a recommendation. We're not even going to give time to that. But we are going to give time and focus to the presence of the cloud. Oh, don't miss this. Don't miss this. It signifies the presence of God. It goes clear back to the deliverance of the Hebrews from bondage. God showed up again in a in a wonderful enveloping cloud. And in that moment, he's, he speaks. When they're fearful, when the, when the apostles are fearful, when all that has led up to Jesus is present also, and the fulfillment is taking place, and there is a bowing down and an acquiescing to Jesus alone, there is this penetrating voice this is my son my beloved one listen to him God is conferring the father is conferring on his son this reality in my son in my loved one in him is redemption. Your redemption is in Him. In every way, in every hope, you need not turn anywhere else. Redemption is in Him. He is your Savior. He is your Redeemer. Leave all the rest behind. These were only precursors. Don't go back to those. They were only shadows. Jesus is who you need. Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the last word. And Jesus is who you need. And they saw Jesus alone. Hmm. Now, you know, some, I've heard some pastors say some really stupid things about this text, and I do not want to be one of them. I've heard individuals say that Jesus was using reverse psychology in verse 9 when He said, as they were coming down from the mountain, He gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. I heard a preacher actually say, Jesus did this because He knew they would go and spread th- spread it abroad. How stupid. I mean, that's just, that's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Jesus didn't re- use reverse psychology. He was saying this, it's not time, boys. It's not time, boys. Don't go talking about this now, but you have been privy. I've let you in on that which I trust will bolster you when my passion comes. 
and when I am crucified, but then when I am raised, then you can talk about these things. Then it will mean more, and then you can share it. He wasn't using reverse psychology. He was just saying, this is, this is a truth that for the most part, until certain things happen, no one would believe anyway. So wait until the time is right. Just like God always does. Doesn't He? Well, you just had to be there. You just had to be there. And you and I were not there. However, you and I need, every one of us needs, our own Jesus moment. Yeah. You might not be able to describe it to anyone else. Some of these things are above our ability to do so. But every one of us needs a Jesus encounter that changes us for time and eternity. And praise God, we can. Thank God we can. So as we close this part of the service today, as we focus on a conclusion to this thought, I pray that in your own hearts and in your own minds, there is the spiritual reality that when everything, when the smoke clears, when the cloud is gone, when other figures have left the scene, I pray that in your life's central choice, you will see Jesus alone. Jesus alone. Father, we thank you for this moment that is recorded in your gospel accounts. You, your spirit inspired holy men to write this account. We thank you and praise you that you have. We have it before us. It still is hard for us to grasp. It's still beyond us. It's still greater than what we can fathom. But thank you that you give us a glimpse and you help us and your spirit helps us. So we would pray this, enlighten us, truly enlighten us with the truth of this great event. And more than anything else, we pray, may in our own lives, in our own faith, in our own response to you, may we, as our hope of redemption, see Jesus, see Jesus, see Jesus alone. May he be all our hope and stay. If there's someone today, Lord, that needs that singular, life-changing moment encounter with Jesus, help them to respond, we pray, in these moments of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.
You may be seated. I have been asked to uh, anoint one of our precious little ones, and we want to do that. Um, the Stoughton family, they have four wonderful little children, and uh, Josephine, Jojo, as we call her, is just having some health issues that especially mom as a medical person and others are concerned about, obviously. So we're going to anoint her today and pray for her today. Is that okay, Jojo? Is that all right? I don't, I don't know if she's agreeing or not. <laughs> Can I pray for you, Joe? Yes. It's all right. That's all right. I'm going to pray for you, Jojo. Jojo, in the name of the Father and the Son. Father, we come to you, the author of life. You're the giver of life. We so thank you for every precious little life that you give us. And Jojo is one of them. Little Josephine is a treasure. She's a gift to this family. She's a gift to us. She's a gift to this world. And I just ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, the great healer, the great physician, you are the one we bring our requests and to whom we make our needs known. And we just ask you, gracious God, to touch little Josephine, help her body to function properly as it should. May everything, Lord, about her blood pressure just be what you order, what you ordain. And we pray your blessing on her life. We pray that her future, Lord, would be just wonderfully and beautifully cradled in your care. Thank you for her. Thank you for Jay and Jamie, this precious family. Touch this little life, we ask. In the, G in the name of Jesus, we pray. And Lord, we just say this. In the days to come, we are going to continue to pray, and we're going to trust you for your good to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. <laughs> I've never had to throw anointing oil at anybody, but I thought we might have to do that. Yes, Gladys. Uh, I would like to be anointed. These three children, they all have cancer. Okay. All brain cancer. All right, this one has leukemia. Okay. A four, a two-year-old, eight to one three. Okay. I want to pray that these two people return. They just spirit rebellious. Okay. And I want victory for David Douglas. All right. If we don't go through this again, it'd be better. Okay. Would some folks gather around here, and um, Gladys has brought a list of individuals who she wants to be anointed for them this morning, and if you would come and help us here and just agree concerning these things, we just want to pray in agreement for these needs. There are three children who have cancer, Amir. Nathan and uh, Jack, we want to pray for them. Uh, they're very young, have cancer. And then we'll just use first names here. Hannah and uh, Mary Jo, who need to come back to the Lord. They need to come back to the Lord. They're just in rebellion, and we need to pray for them. Then we're praying for uh, David and Bill. God knows who all these are, and we're just going to commit them to the Lord in prayer. So Gladys, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as a stand-in for these precious lives, these lives <clears throat> that matter to Jesus, we know this, Jesus has died and given His life for every one of these lives. 
We pray first of all for these precious little ones stricken with cancer. Oh God, we pray that you would just invade those lives and come in in a wonderful healing way and deliver them from this disease and deliver them from this intrusion on their health. We just ask you, Lord, that you would work miraculously in their lives. So, Father, we commit them to you. Then, Lord, we also pray for Hannah and Mary Jo. Lord, they need you. They have moved away from you. They are walking away from you. And, Lord, that is never a proposition. It's never a proposition that works. It only brings heartache, and it only brings ultimate ruin. So we ask, O oh God, if, if anyone ought to be concerned about those who've walked away from you and walked away from light, it ought to be the people of God. So we ask, O oh God, that you would quicken them. We pray for a convicting power brought to them by the Holy Spirit that will bring them back, awaken them to their foolishness, awaken them to their folly, and we pray in the name of Jesus that you'd bring them back. Then, Lord, we pray for, <clears throat> for David and Bill. And, Lord, you know who specifically they are and for whom we're praying. We ask, O oh God, for deliverance in David's life that is so real, so true, and so lasting that he does not uh, revert to the old way. And so we pray, Lord, for a redemption and a deliverance that only you can bring that, that Lord, will not, will not provide relapse. We just pray, O oh God, for a wonderful work in his life. And then we pray for this individual, Bill, and ask, O oh God, for his need as well. Thank you, Father, that we can stand in the gap for those who are in need. Thank you that that's a privilege of your people to do so. And Lord, if anyone, again, ought to care, if anyone ought to care about these needs, precious lives, and the lost, it's the people of God. So, Father, thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for letting us pray today. Thank you, Lord, that we're trusting you today. And we just agree together. In this congregation, we agree together as meeting these needs according to your perfect, perfect pleasure and your will. We trust you for you do all things well. So have your way, we pray. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we're praying for a niece of Dave and Joan Herb. And Lord, we're praying for her. We lift her up and just ask, oh, God, that you would work in her life. We know that she needs healing. She needs recovery uh, after having fallen. But, Lord, far beyond that, we know that she needs Jesus. So we bring her to you today that we pray out of this, out of this accident, out of the necessary surgery, there will be the quiet time of her reflecting on her life that you as your spirit could lead and help her, Lord, to come to a, a desire to know you, come to a hunger and a longing for Jesus. So we commit her to you today as well. Be with our precious people, some who are recovering, some who need healing, some who are isolated, some who are lonely, and Lord, some still dealing with COVID. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen, touch, and heal our good people, all for your glory, that the name of the Lord would be praised, and that, Lord, your name would be magnified, and that people would come to Jesus, that people would come to you. And God's people, in agreement, prayed together, amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, Gladys. Well, there are reasons why we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We know that these are strange days, days like none of us has known. But we need, we need the people of God, don't we? We need the people of God. I had the privilege of talking to Tess Akers on the phone because I had missed her birthday Monday. So I called her. I said, Tess, I missed your birthday Monday. She said, I know you did. <laughs> I said, so I'm, I'm calling to offer a belated birthday wish. And she was gracious to me. 
But we shared on the phone and she said, Pastor, our people need to know how much we need our brothers and sisters in Christ. I said, yes, Tess, I know that, we do. So she said, as soon as I get my next shot, she said, I'm going to be back in worship. So, friends, these are weird days, strange days. And we've all had to just kind of navigate very, very uncertain, different things. But we need one another. We need one another. So I just encourage you, thank you for being here today. And those who are watching um, and joining us by live stream, the day's coming, and I believe and pray and hope it's soon. The day's coming when uh, some of the fears are going to be assuaged and we're going to be able to gather in person and worship together, and there isn't anything, anything that matches that. I'm just convinced of that. There isn't anything that matches that. We thank the Lord for live stream, but it's not enough. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand. We'll pray, and then, you know, we've got some kind of a snowstorm coming again, I guess. It's winter, and Ponxatani Phil saw his shadow, so science has spoken. So as a result, get ready for the storm. Be careful. And uh, if you don't need to be out, don't be out. But uh, be careful as you, as you deal with this in the next couple of days. Let's pray. Father, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Oh, that we would see Jesus. Oh, that we would look full in His wonderful face. Things of earth grow strangely dim when we do that. And we're not dismissive of this life, and we're not dismissive of its concerns. But Father, I pray that we will, without question, be led by, directed by, the greatest reality of all, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, the King. May we be led by Him and look to Him and follow Him as we listen to Him. Thank you for this day. Send us on our way safely. Guide us to our homes without incident. Keep us in the days to come. And may your name be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go in His grace and peace. You're dismissed.